Greetings, internet itinerants. I am fascinated by radical ideas in politics. Perhaps there is no other mainstream political party in the US as radical as the Libertarian Party. But if the statement of principles as declared by the Libertarian Party seems too tame for you, that's because they need to be mass appealing. If you think their party principles are too extreme, then you haven't seen anything yet. Libertarians are universally right-leaning on economic issues, but different factions tend to disagree on social and state matters. In this video essay, I will talk about numerous libertarian factions and people, while focusing mainly on their viewpoints on social and state matters. You may then ask, why should I give any attention or thought to radicals and their ideas for the future? My answer to this question is that you must know thy enemy, their thoughts and visions, in order to fight them more effectively. I say this because I find their motivations and end goals dangerous for equity and democracy. The libertarian movement could in the simplest of terms be understood as a reactionary force against the New Deal. The New Deal was a fiscal program ratified by the Franklin D. Roosevelt administration in 1933. It introduced several welfare policies, higher tax rates and consolidated power to the federal government. Some libertarians nevertheless claim that their ideological heritage seeks even further back because it aligns itself with the radicalism of the Declaration of Independence and the limited government as presented by the Constitution. Following this logic, all government encroachments on individual liberty since then have undermined the original libertarian spirit which founded USA. To exemplify, these setbacks are perceived as being the destruction of the secessionist Southern Confederacy after the Civil War, the onset of progressivism, FDR's New Deal, and the American imperialist wars of the 20th century. This brings us to a significant divide between libertarians, namely the difference between minarchists and anarchists. The minarchists propose a minimal state which should only exist for protecting private property rights. In the minarchist interpretation, the state is stripped of everything except its monopoly and violence. The anarchists wish to abolish the government altogether and let the invisible hand of the free market guide all socio-economic interactions. This way, the state's monopoly on violence is broken and entirely delegated through the free market to private protection agencies. These two positions more than often are good indicators for identifying the level of radicalism possessed by each individual libertarian. In the 1970s, some groups within the libertarian movement split with its former allies of the new left over disputes about the validity of egalitarianism. This development pressed libertarian figurehead Murray Rothbard to distance himself from the new left founding the Cato Institute in 1974 with Ed Crane and Charles Koch. The Cato Institute would become the most influential think tank shadowing the Libertarian Party. But disagreements on political strategies led to Rothbard's departure from the Institute in 1981. You see, Rothbard was a self-described anarcho-capitalist, while many of the Cato Institute's members were minarchists, who believed they could achieve minimal government through winning elections by means of the Libertarian Party. Murray Rothbard was in staunch opposition to what he perceived as the Libertarian Party's unfaithfulness to true libertarian values, thereby taking an acutely conservative stance on social issues. As is evident when he founded a new think tank in 1982 together with Lou Rockwell and others. This think tank became known as the Ludwig von Mises Institute, the think tank was funded by Ron Paul, who was the Libertarian Party nominee in 1988. But the libertarian strain of thought developed here was remarkably conservative. 
and in the early 90s they developed a new doctrine of libertarianism called paleo-libertarianism. Briefly, paleo-libertarianism, with its roots deep in the old right, sees the Leviathan state as the institutional source of evil throughout history, the unhampered free market as a moral and practical imperative, private property as an economic and moral necessity for a free society, the garrison state as a preeminent threat to liberty and social well-being, the welfare state as organized theft that victimizes producers and eventually even its clients, civil liberties based on property rights as essential to a just society, the egalitarian ethic as morally reprehensible and destructive of private property and social authority, social authority embodied in the family, church, community and other intermediating institutions as needed to protect the individual from the state and necessary for a free and virtuous society. Western culture as eminently worthy of preservation and defense. Objective standards of morality, especially as found in the Judeo-Christian tradition, as essential to the free and civilized social order. As you can probably tell, the paleo-libertarian goal was to unite the libertarians and the recently emerging paleo-conservatives into a common far-right cause. With the paleo-libertarian manifesto laid out by Lou Rockwell, Rothbard formulated a strategy for distributing the ideology to the wider public. This approach, called right-wing populism, would become the stable strategy for spreading far-right ideas. He criticized the Cato Institute and Libertarian Party for promoting a strategy of cozying up to the corridors of power, of lobbying and influencing the top elites, of nudging them gently onto a more libertarian path. Rothbard was convinced that the paleo-libertarian movement needed a right-wing populist, contemporarily embodied in David Duke, who could appeal to the true Americans. Rothbard pointed out that the right-wing populist's demographic target should be rednecks, because they were the most oppressed, but also had the most social leverage. The right-wing populists should campaign for president on a promise of abolishing taxes and welfare systems. The campaign should also clearly point out the need for resolute action, crush criminals and get rid of bums, destroy the banking cartel, first of all the Fed, and finally to prioritize traditional American and family values. On his path to power, the right-wing populist should strive to build up a cadre of his own libertarians, minimal government opinion molders, and tap the masses directly to short-circuit the dominant media and intellectual elites to rouse the masses of people against the elites that are looting them. Rothbard's right-wing populism was frighteningly accurate in predicting events that would occur almost three decades later during the Trump era. The paleo-libertarian movement, at its conception, found support from notable figures such as Ron Paul, but also attracted many paleo-conservatives. Paleo-conservatism was essentially a reactionary movement against the neoconservatism of the 1980s. They advocated for a white ethnostate with focus on localism, religion and small-scale private property rights. Paleocons and paleo-libertarians found common ground on numerous state and social issues, such as limited government, opposition to the civil rights movement of the 60s, support for homeschooling, traditional values and a disdain towards the perceived liberal elite. Furthermore, According to fusionist theory, as described by a National Review columnist in the 1950s, libertarians and religionists were working towards a future common goal. The Paleo Alliance has proven fruitful since the 90s. Discontent with social and state affairs, as well as growing distrust in democracy, has seemingly been on the upswing among USA's population in recent decades. Rothbard died in 1995, but his legacy continues through his disciple Hans Hermann Hoppe, who persistently spreads ideas of voluntary race segregation and the right of state secession. Hoppe is quoted for infamously postulating that Democrats and Communists will have to be physically separated and expelled from the free society on the grounds that they are potential enemies of private property rights. 
The alt-right figurehead Richard Spencer has credited Ron Paul for his political awakening. And Christopher Cantwell, who partook at the Unite the Right rally, expressed his admiration for Rothbard, declaring, I later became a big fan of Murray Rothbard and Ayn Rand. You might be aware these people are Jewish. Shocking to some then that I am today a rather vocal anti-Semite. Many members of the alt-right movement confess that they started out as libertarians. Equally many recognize that Rothbard, Hoppe and Ron Paul hold a special place in their ideological development. These connections demonstrate the tangible libertarian to alt-right pipeline, who numerous radical right-wing ideologues have followed. The reason as to why this pipeline exists may be that the paleo-libertarian doctrine makes room for discriminatory, anti-democratic views based in a traditionalist worldview. Kevin Vallier, a left-leaning libertarian, blames personal attributes to why the former libertarians may have turned alt-right. Libertarianism is an unpopular view, and it takes particular personality types to be open to taking unpopular views. Some of these personality types simply enjoy holding outrageous and provocative views, who like to argue and fight with others, who like to insult and shock. So what is to be done? Well, my best advice is that you stay aware of these ideas that I have outlined here and resist the fascist temptation. The Mises Institute is still the major paleo-libertarian think tank. Ron Paul's son, Rand Paul, is a Republican senator who has been quoted as agreeing with many of the same ideas as his father pushed for. Rand Paul can be understood as an archetypical politician in the sense that he publicly distances himself from controversial characters he otherwise works closely with the moment they cross the line into dangerous territory. But make no mistake, both Pauls push for libertarian goals in politics. The only thing separating them from the alt-right are the suit and the tie and the conveniently downplayed ideology they're compromisingly adopting to appeal to the wider public. Also be aware of revisionist history, which in the worst of cases can corrupt your worldview. A prime example of dangerous revisionist history is Thomas E. Woods, the politically incorrect guide to American history. Tom Woods is a self-described Rothbardian anarcho-capitalist libertarian, a senior fellow at the Mises Institute and a founding member of the white supremacist League of the South. The book, which was on the New York Times bestseller list in 2005, is basically neo-confederate propaganda with sympathetic overtones towards the Civil War secessionist South. Hopefully you will remember this analysis and history of right-wing libertarianism the next time you enter political discourse. Be aware of dangerous political ideas, stay safe and keep your wits about you.